All right, we're going to get started. Uh, hello and welcome. Thanks for attending this uh, AIA East Bay event. So my name is Brian Streisick. I am the 2022 East Bay Board President. And we welcome all of you here and thankful that you can participate in this uh, great event. Uh, this housing forum has been a long time coming. Madeline and I had been talking about it for several years at uh, regional urban design forum meetings. And finally, Ashley, our former president, she really just kind of said, hey, here's what we're going to do. We're going to have two housing events per year that are going to be related to the housing forum. So I really appreciate that directness by her. And Madeline, Ashley, and I have all been um, putting those events on. So this is the third event we've done. We did two last year. We're going to do another bigger forum later on in the year dealing with housing. Uh, we all know it's a major issue in the Bay Area. and so glad to have Michael Piatak here to kind of address some of those issues and as he has so much experience um, in this. Uh, a couple of events I wanted to announce before we I hand it over. And first one is we are going to have an AI East Bay new home town hall uh, tomorrow at noon. So we've been looking for, we let go of our space on Clay Street uh, in the pandemic and we've been looking for a new space since then. So. We want to hear from members about the new space, what their thoughts are, and uh, the space we're considering is the Brower Center. Uh, so please attend if you are interested in figuring out where our home base may be and have comments about that. Another event I want to bring up is the Regional Urban Design Forum is doing an event in Vacaville on June 2nd at six o'clock. And we're going to be talking about a Boys and Girls Club nationally states and then also the Vacaville chapter and how they are approaching a new facility and the challenges of that. Um, before that event, we are going to do a listening tour of, of members in that area. So if anyone is from the Vacaville area or that area of our chapter, please come out and talk to me and Mike and we wanna hear what members are thinking about uh, the future, uh, the past and um, really try to keep developing this chapter uh, to be as great as possible. Uh, so I'm gonna hand it over to Madeline Zagas um, to introduce Michael Paita. Great, thanks uh, Brian. I'm really excited to um, be part of the team hosting this wonderful event, AIA Bay. Um, as you say, we're really excited about uh, housing issues and we're really excited about um, our um, speaker tonight, Michael Platok of AIA, and uh, just wanted to say before I introduce him that uh, we would like to know who our audience is. And so uh, if people want to just write a little note about who they are in terms of, you know, what you do for a living, so we get a little bit of a sense for who's in the audience and we can better address, um, you know, maybe, you know, Mike might be curious about that. We'd, we'd just like to know. Um, Feel free to, you know, to type something now, and we will be looking at that. Uh, and also wanted to emphasize that, you know, you can write questions um, during the presentation at any time, and we will be collecting them and and, and uh, holding them until the end when we're going to have a Q and A. Uh, so please stay for the for the long thing for the whole thing. So uh, Mike Piatok, he has been an architect and a professor of architectural design for 55 years. Uh, he opened his uh, firm in 1984, and since then, he's designed over 40,000 units of housing for low-income households in the U.S. and abroad. Uh, at the heart of his work is his participatory design process that he uses to deeply involve residents, community members, and stakeholders in the revitalization of low-income communities and strengthening of mixed-income neighborhoods. Uh, he can talk a little bit more about how he does that. Um, and uh, in 2013, the AIA honored Mike with the Thomas Jefferson Award for Public Architecture in recognition of his contribution to the design of affordable housing. Mike is a professor emeritus at the University of Washington and an invited lecturer at UC Berkeley. Uh, in 2021, Mike retired from Piatok as founding principal and contributes to the office projects on a consultatory basis. Um, I would say Mike was also a former um, Employ, employer of mine, I'm really proud uh, to present him. So without further ado, um, please welcome Mike Pytok. Thank you, Madeline. 
It's too bad. I can't hear all the applause, but I see some hands moving. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, thank you very much for asking me to share some of my thoughts with, with those folks who are interested. Thank you to the AIA for, for sponsoring this and for continuing their interest in all these critical housing issues. Um, whenever I'm asked to talk about the work that our office has done over the years in affordable housing, I always feel obligated to kind of put it into a larger context so people aren't fooled by all the pretty pictures thinking that the problems of affordable housing are actually being solved in this country because we're not even coming close to solving them. And, and so I like to really set that context so people see how serious the crisis is and the inequities in this, in this country that are built in, that are wired, uh, impo seemingly impossible to change. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with that. And that's usually about a half an hour. And then I do five case studies just from Oakland. Our work stretches from Seattle to San Diego, but I'm just focusing on five projects that are within almost walking distance of where I live. So they're very close to home. They're kind of like in my backyard or front yard. Um, but, and that usually took about 45 minutes. So I took all of that, collapsed it, and, and hopefully I could get all this done in 45 minutes instead of the usual abbreviated version, which is about an hour and a half, because the real talk is about three hours. But you'll get the 45 minute um, cheap, cheap version. Uh, so let me share my screen. Okay, and... I went too far. Okay, I'm starting here with a, a cartoon from 120 years ago, it was around 1900 in the previous uh, Gilded Age. We are now in a new Gilded Age where the super rich are so out of sight compared to the rest of us. And we have a very high percentage of poor folks. And the same cartoon can be used today. Low wages, high rents, and people are being squeezed from, from both hands. I mean, during the pandemic, hard to believe, but about every 17 hours, there was a new billionaire created during the two years. And altogether, those billionaires accumulated an additional $5 trillion of wealth while everybody else was suffering and losing income. And Oxfam estimates that at least a thousand people a day die, or each hour rather, a thousand an hour are dying because of the wealth inequality and, and, and the poverty. And globally, when you look at it, yeah, we've got about 2 billion people now living in slums uh, all across the developing uh, countries. And we have it in our own country. Uh, you, you all see it every day. You go to different sections of Oakland or anywhere in the Bay Area, you'll see encampments of people for whom the, neither the public sector nor the private sector are, have been able to meet their, their needs. And the contrasts are truly extraordinary when you see these slums juxtaposed to the very high end as in this image here, everybody has their own, their own little balcony and, and you know, jacuzzi or pool. So it's pretty grim globally. And it's not that different in the US. 20% of the population now owns 85% of the wealth and wealth is ownership of businesses and properties. The means of production is some, sometimes it's called. They own um, stocks and bonds. They own all the stuff uh, that makes the country tick. The middle class, about 40% of the population, they own about 15% of that wealth, usually in the form of their homes, their cars. Um, maybe they have some uh, retirement program. But 40% of the country owns absolutely nothing. They rent. They rent their cars, they rent their houses. Um, maybe they own uh, their washing machines and refrigerator, but, but that's about it. It's, it's virtually nothing. And those are the folks we're talking about here who are having this serious housing crisis. Um, world, health, uh, world wealth is dis distributed much in the same way, except it's even worse. 8% controls about 85% of the wealth. 71% has only about 3%. So economic democracy, US style, there's the numbers in a, in a different kind of bar graph. Um, 
But what's interesting about the nature of our times, and I'm gonna to try to move your faces off to the side a little more so I can see my slides because I can't fully see them, but anyway, I can't do it. Um, but what's interesting is that historically, it was the middle class that was responsible for the lion's share of consumption. And that's changed now, top 20% because of their wealth. Uh, they are responsible for about 60% of the economy, the consumption that takes place in the economy. And the bottom, um, you know, the 40% of the middle class and the 40% of the bottom class, they're only responsible for about 40% of the consumption because they're just simply not earning enough to be able to buy. So if we look at income, we have about 120, 130 million households now and 75% of them have no children. You know, they're singles, they're couples without kids yet or intentionally not having kids or they're post kids, they're seniors. And about 25% of the households are actually raising kids. And 40% of those households raising kids are doing it with just one parent. And if you look at the distribution of the numbers of people in these households, um, obviously the 75% the with no children are responsible for a small portion of the population. The families make up the lion's share of the population. But when you look at their annual incomes, the no kid households are earning about 80% of the annual income earned by all households in the United States. And all those families who are raising children, uh, whether with two parents or one parent, they're earning only about 20% of the annual household incomes. So the kids are being raised on, you know, not that much of the nation's income. And the people with only one parent have only about 5% of the annual income. So they're suffering the most. And so most of the housing that we deal with are for low-income seniors, but also low-income single-parent households trying to raise their kids on meager income. Now, if you look at open, upward mobility now from generation to generation, we're now 27th. Um, we used to be much higher on the spectrum in the top five. My generation, I grew up in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. The upward mobility was still very possible with good public education and the 25% of the workforce unionized, uh, people were doing pretty well and you could pull yourselves up by the bootstraps. So I came from a single parent family my mother was on welfare in the early years and then had modest incomes after that uh, at, at annual salaries. And, and yet we were, both my brother and I were able to pull out of it. Good schooling, hard work, and um, the cost of living was not that out of the question for us. And plus we had rent control in New York City. Uh, that was a form of housing subsidy, if you will. So it only took about 25% of the bite out of my mother's minimum wage. She was earning a dollar an hour and uh, that's 40 bucks a week or 160 bucks a month. And the rent was 40 bucks a month, exactly 25%. So it was doable back in those days. It's no longer doable for the bottom 40%. It's a real struggle. And now we're way down here, as you can see on the far right. If you, know, if you want the American dream, you're gonna have to move to Canada. That is, the dream is to move up out of your meager social conditions to uh, a better social and economic status. Uh, you're not going to be able to do it in this country if you're in that bottom 40%, not any longer. Income injustice, over the past 15 years, CEO income has grown by at least 300%. I think the number is much higher now. Worker income, income has grown by only about 4%. And the minimum wage buying power has actually dropped by 9%. And if you look at it racially, medium net worth of white households is 11 times that of black households and about nine times greater than Hispanic households. And that's primarily because more whites own homes than, than minorities do. And a lot of their wealth is tied up in their homes. So, um, Maybe this country needs a maximum uh, wage, uh, Bezos, uh, you know, billions and billions. Um, and, and these folks put, put it in these terms, $200,000 house for every homeless person in America, including the children. Um, 
and he can fix the, the Flint's water system 12 times over. So he's super rich, super rich. He doesn't know what to do with it, so he shoots people up into the edge of space for fun um, and, and wastes all that wealth that was produced by the hardworking people in his company and those of us who use his service. So we often see and know of the photographs that documented the, the last Great Depression in the, in the 30s, but we have it now, as I said earlier, and as you all know, you see it everywhere, and it's terribly underestimated. I, mean, I think the, the Oakland estimates something like 8,000 people are on the streets. It's, it's much more than that. They count it twice a year, windshield survey at night, um, one night, and, and they think they've counted the numbers who are homeless. And when you look at Congress, why isn't Congress doing anything about it? Well, from what class did most of the members of Congress come from? Well, lo and behold, 90% of the people in the Senate and the House of Representatives are in that top 20% and only uh, nine, 10% come from the middle and lower classes. So it's understandable their lens is quite different from those who are in the bottom. And as much as they try, and the Democrats certainly try, um, they are um, prevented uh, at every turn by the Republicans who are really coming from the very top of, of that uh, strata. Now, if you look at the taxes that were placed on the super rich in this country across the last decade or uh, century, back in the Gilded Age, you know, it was barely eight or nine percent was the tax rate on the super rich. But that shot way up during World War I because even the rich were willing to pay to fight that war because they needed to win or else they would lose out on all their wealth. So they were willing to pay their fair share up to over 70 percent of their income was taxed. Um, but that dropped, of course, a lot more money and wealth was put in the hands after World War I of few people. And we get the Great Depression. You put a lot of wealth in the hands of few people and they do stupid things. They're not doing things on behalf of the broader uh, country and the broader community. They're doing it for themselves. And so it all collapsed. And under FDR, the taxation rate on those top 10% dramatically increased, partly to fund this new deal but partly also to fight World War II. But what I always found interesting about this history of the taxation of the rich was that Eisenhower brought it back up to that steady level during his two terms as a Republican because he knew what needed to be done, at least at that time, he was the interstate highway system and he used a military excuse for wanting to do it, but he created a lot of jobs. And during that period, 25%, as I said earlier, 25% of the workforce is unionized. Now it's only 11%. And much of that is public employees, not, not private employees. Kennedy and Johnson more or less kept it up there because of their social goals. But it began to drop. First under Nixon, Ford and Carter kind of maintained it. And then under Reagan and Bush, it plummeted again. Clinton managed to bring it up a little bit, but then under Bush too, it really plummeted. So then they were paying 15, 18% tax, uh, tax rate as compared to you know, 35, 40% for the middle class in, in, in the US. So of course we are at the great recession. Once you put that much wealth in the hands of so few people, they do stupid things with it. Certainly not concerned about the welfare of the country. <clears throat> Let me move on. We gotta move through this quickly. Ah, oh, our friend, um, uh, Jamie Dimon, CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase. This was about four years ago. His annual salary was 27 million. And when I read that, I had just received my annual re you know, report from Social Security. My 60 years of working, I started working when I was uh, 14, <clears throat> was equal to my 60 years of accumulated income was equal to six weeks of his annual salary. I mean, talk about inequality. So when I did the math at my present income, and that was at the peak of my earning capacity, I was a principal of, of, an, of my office, I would have to work about another 185 years to equal one year of his salary. So when I did the numbers, I was very pissed. <laughs> um, I still can't get out of my mind. 
So what's happened since 48 to 2014 anyway, the productivity level in the US has dramatically increased 240% because of machinery, because of the computers, it just got more efficient. But the rate of increase of hourly compensation is only about 100, 112%. So obviously the wealth that all of us, intellectual labor, manual labor, all the wealth that we're producing is not being fed back into us. It's being sucked out by the investor class and that top 10%. They're getting all the benefits of our labor. Here's another horrifying fact, especially with the news that was in the papers today. 17,000 Americans are killed by other Americans every year. I mean, think about that. We're killing ourselves off at a rate of 17,000 a year. In the past 20 years, during the Afghan and Iraqi war, during which we lost 7,100 people in the war, we lost 340,000 people on our own streets, in our own communities, in our own schools. Americans killing other Americans in those 20 years, 340,000. And 45,000 Americans each year commit suicide. I mean, it's incredible. Over the 20 years of those two wars, that's 900,000 Americans killed themselves. And 70% of them are white men. Most of the middle-aged white men. Most of them from those flyover states, the rural areas of the country. They're hurting and they have obvious prey for demagogues as we saw in 2016 and again in 2020. And about 22 million attempted suicide in those 20 years. So this country has some very sick, sick problems. 100,000 drug overdoses this past year. Now that was the highest rate since they've been, the CDC has been keeping numbers, but cumulatively over those 20 years of that war, of those two wars, a million overdoses in the US, in a sense, a kind of self-inflicted homicide, suicide. So you put all of those together, two and a quarter million Americans killed themselves during the Afghan and Iraqi wars on our own land. Something's very wrong in this country. And I attribute it to that vast gap between those who have and those who don't have. It's causing enormous stress for a lot of people. They can't handle it. Another interesting fact about the US, we have more people behind bars far ahead of our close second, Russia, the evil empire of Russia. We're outpacing them with people behind bars because a lot of those prisons now are private prisons. They have a vested interest in keeping themselves full. That's how they may remain profitable because they have to compensate their investors. So they have a lobby that's constantly churning in all those state um, uh, legislatures to pass laws to make it easier to put people into prison, to keep their prisons full. And they make these contracts with the, with the government that regardless of the numbers of people in the prison, they will be compensated for full occupancy. I look at South Africa, now China, 125 for 100,000, that's probably not a, an accurate number because they probably don't even consider all the, uh, the Uyghurs to be in, in prison. They're in a concentration camp, a million of them. Let me keep moving here. So I'm gonna bring it closer to home. Everything's wired, as I said, to help the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. What about our federal housing subsidies? Well, look at by income bracket, how they get distributed. The people in the upper income brackets are getting the lion's share of the federal assistance in housing. Those dark raise of the rent subsidies and all those who are homeowners get all kinds of tax breaks for owning their home. And the bigger the home and the wealthier the home, the more expensive the home, the bigger the tax break. So another way of looking at it, federal subsidies to homeowners graphically are about that much and for the federal subsidies to renters are about that much. But what's shocking about the federal subsidies to homeowners, 60% of those subsidies go to the top 20% income earners. So everything shifted and wired to help the rich get richer or stay rich. So in the face of all this, why do we even bother to design affordable housing for the bottom quarter of Americans when it really reaches only about 5% who need it? That's all the work by the nonprofits, all the work by the housing authorities across the country. You're only getting 
so many more are just not being touched by any of that help. So I sometimes think in my darker moments that our design talents, as we were designing affordable housing, we're just being used as a smoke screen to make it seem like America has this problem under control. Well, nothing could be further from the truth. So we're just a front to help people feel like we're doing the right thing, that the country is on the right path when we're nowhere near being on the right path. So with that as an uplifting um, introduction, <laughs> I was gonna talk about five projects that are close to where, that, that dot is roughly where I live in Oakland. And um, those of you who know Oakland, most of the hills are white, most of the flatlands are minorities, although a number of these neighborhoods are beginning to whiten, um, they're gentrifying because they're close to the BART stations and to San Francisco. Our neighborhood is, has fewer African Americans. When I moved in, we were 45% African American, 35% white, and about 15% uh, each of Latino and, and Asian. Um, it's now about 30% African American. Uh, the white has more or less stayed the same. It's the Latino and Asian communities that have begun to increase. And the neighborhoods out in East Oakland are still predominantly African American. They still have a stronghold there. And but I understand that even the rents are going up now in this area of East Oakland. They're going up at considerable rates. So we'll we'll see what happens in in the, in the near future out there. So the five projects I was going to talk about all clustered around this. The office did these. Over the last 25 years, I think the first one was 97, and then um, the latest one is two years ago. And as Madeline mentioned, we try whenever we can with our nonprofits and housing authorities to engage either the residents who are there now or the neighbors in some process of, of, of engagement and design so that we're hearing uh, the values of those who might be living there and have a better chance of doing something that might be meaningful and helpful uh, in their lives. These are various workshops. I don't go into detail, maybe in the, in the Q and A, we could talk a little bit about it. We do it differently each time. It all depends on the, on the nonprofit, on the numbers of people involved. And, and sometimes we hit communities that just don't want us at all. I think I saw Teresa in the audience, one of our um, uh, principals, and she was running a project that had, she, she was scarred by it. She could, in the Q&A, maybe she can talk about it, but total opposition to it. But the supervisor, the county supervisor was in favor of it. I think it's gone forward. Uh, maybe she can clue you in on that. This was one that we did down in San Diego. It's a Latino neighborhood involved about 100 people from the neighborhood in a series of workshops and, and eventually uh, decided on how to put in 200 units in a city park and um, and they're all built out now including the, the park uh, and they rescued it and salvaged and, and restored a, a tidal creek in the, in the process. So these five projects that label them in sequence here one two three four five one is the latest one Casa Arabella, 90 units to the acre, about 265 bedrooms to the acre, about 350 people. I always try to put it in these terms because planners just simply call them units per acre, which is not a good measure of density. Um, you're really just measuring kitchens per acre because that's what defines a unit. And 90 units of market rate will only produce maybe 180 people, whereas 90 units of affordable family housing will produce about 320 people. So it's, it's maybe uh, three to four times more dense than a, a market rate project. So our four story project is equivalent to a 12 story market rate project in terms of numbers of people housed. So that whole Fruitvale area has been quite active over the years. Uh, Arabella Martinez was really the uh, woman who made it all happen across those decades the whole redevelopment of the area and now it's a center for the Latino culture. And these are the blocks that were owned by BART that she pushed hard over the decades to get them redeveloped, push the parking out or put it into a parking structure. And there's the BART station 
and our uh, it's really as you look at these dots that's uh, Lake Merritt and there's city center and there's West Oakland and there's San Francisco it's only 17 minutes from the fruit Boulevard station so it's really a well connected location plus it has international Boulevard with all kinds of mom and pop shops stretching from the downtown all the way out to the San Leandro border. So it's really a series of main streets serving the adjacent neighborhoods and Fruitvale has done the most, it seems to be the, the most successful in making that happen a lot because of what uh, Arabella did uh, over, over those decades. And the hope is to try to now link international with this side of the tracks um, because it's, this has not seen much uh, development or redevelopment. And our project, which you see here in the foreground, is also making that effort. We have a muse that comes through here and the street comes through. So hopefully in time, this area will begin to transform and we'll get some more affordable housing there. Um, it was an odd shaped site. And um, as I said, that's the date of uh, the, the next phase is on the construction right now. Uh, Ernie Vasquez is the architect for that one as he was the architect for the first two phases that have been there now for at least 15 years. And what we basically, and there's the muse that will connect our two and then connect the neighborhood back through underneath the tracks. Our strategy was to give all the large families their own two-story houses so they get through ventilation. This is an outdoor walkway here to get to these guys. And then the two bedrooms and one bedrooms are further back in. Um, and the, all the one bedrooms were stacked back here with some two bedrooms. So we had the fewest number of people closest to the bark tracks. Although we have great windows, so you really don't hear the bar as it comes and goes. And it's in a slow down and startup mode. It's not barreling along as it comes into the station. And we were able to get the parking then concentrated uh, at a 0.5 ratio back here next to bar. So we got a real on grade courtyard as a result. Um, and there's the phase two uh, that's now um, under construction. There's our muse. So that great courtyard that's on the ground and the garage up against BART and the community facilities are at the link the joint between our open space, the Muse and our future neighbors, which will also be affordable housing. It was supposed to be market rate, but they couldn't get interest, uh, I guess, by investors and, and it just didn't have, so it's, it's all affordable housing as well. And that would, that this will be the connector. Those are our two bedroom flats. There's all the three bedroom townhomes over here and the stack of three bedroom flats. So we have some accessible three bedroom units. And then on top of the parking, one level up are these two more smaller, more quiet courtyards where you have all the one bedroom units here and then some more two bedroom units as flats. And then there's the other stack of three bedroom, two story townhomes. So we have 180 bedrooms, but only 12 of them are directly facing BART. The other thing we try to do, even at these higher densities, 90 to the acre, 90 units to the acre, is get natural ventilation through ventilation. So we try to get double-sided units for the flats and also for the townhouses. You see that kitchen, dining, living level, and then the bedroom level has windows here. It's only a couple of some units in here that are getting ventilation really only from the one side. So in the neighborhood side, we broke the scale down into pieces that are sort of house-like, four-story townhouse model, if you will, um, with the admin on the corner. And then as we worked around the, the block, this is the side that faces the muse. It was gonna be more residential as well. So again, we articulated it with these room size uh, segments. And when we faced the school that was to our south, which was a big open space for the school, with simpler planes with less articulation and that's the garage entry. And then along the barn tracks with the garage, um, we had bigger masses to relate to that infrastructure scale, but um, you know, enhanced the imagery with the, with the sunscreens we needed to protect them from the, the living rooms from the Southwest light and the big overhang up on top took care of the um, the upper floors and the vines are growing in already down on the garage. So we had these two openings to so those two courtyards up above so they could get some uh, view of the BART as it comes by. BART riders, when the train stops, you can take a peek in and see the courtyard. 
And here's the grand courtyard on the ground floor. As I said, it's on grade. So those trees will eventually really get nice, big, thick uh, um, canopies. There'll be lots of nice shade in there. There's that second walkway to the, uh, up on the third floor to the townhomes that are above here. Those are bedroom windows up here. Kitchen dining, uh, living on, on this floor with kitchen windows facing the, uh, the courtyard. So it's really a space for the kids. Stack flats, as you see in the distance here, we tried to break that motel style look that sometimes happens when you have these exterior walkways. So we had the middle one being solid power pit and then the other ones being more open metal, metal railings. And here's the walk up on that um, upper level for the townhomes, introducing some wood structure, exposed wood structure to warm the place up. Then the smaller courtyards with it, one bedroom units are, and, and some of the two bedroom units are, they're quieter spaces, and you get that peekaboo out to Bart, and you get some of that southwest light streaming in through, through those windows. And then we had a nice stair right off the front lobby to encourage people to take the stair rather than the elevator, because it's only, you know, one, two, three flights up. I grew up in a four-story tenement, lived on the top floor, and I we had no elevator, so we took the stairs all the time. And so now I'm very healthy with bad knees that I had to have replaced last year during COVID, with bionic knees. Um, but I still think having the four-story walk up was healthy for me those first 22 years. Um, and there's those uh, stack flats on that side. And we had a muralist, a mural that ran up the full four stories. So you can see it from the outside and also along your journey up the stairs and have windows in it with these uh, louvered uh, rain screens really to keep the rain from blowing in. And the hummingbird was really a symbol of uh, Arabella, Arabella Martinez who made all this happen starting 30, 40 years ago. I mean, she was lobbying Congress in, in DC as well as the state, as well as the county to get all the capital to flow to make all of this stuff happen over the years. Um, and then the last finishing touch, those townhouses across the street uh, that run along East 12th have um, their own porches and, and, and half of the porches is covered with just the trellis. And we equipped them with eye hooks and these bird houses to help encourage the folks to realize that, you know, this is something to decorate. And it's worked on our other projects. You go back a few years later and everybody's decorated their, their porches uh, with hanging vines or, or wind chimes or other you know, Halloween or Christmas paraphernalia. So a few blocks away, we did the seven directions. Uh, and that was completed in 08. Um, I should mention all the people who were involved in this. Um, I, I think Curtis was involved, that Peter was involved in this one. Um, Kai, uh, from our office and this one, Curtis was involved, Marcial was involved in this Seven Directions project. And that's 50 units per acre, 120, about 200 people per acre. And that sits on top of the um, East Oakland, the, the Native American Health Center. Um, they wanted to put a, a, a medical a clinic on this block. And I said, you know, you're only a few blocks walk from the BART station, why not put housing above it as well? And they said, we don't know how to do housing. Then we'll joint venture with the East Bay um, Asian Local Development Corporation, who, by the way, was the client of Casa Arabella, along with the Unity Council, Spanish speaking Unity Council joint venture. And this one uh, was a joint venture between the um, uh, Native American Health Center and the East Bay Asian Local Development Corporation. Um, we had our workshops primarily with the Native American community to help design the clinic, but also the, the, the housing above and the ideas behind the uh, shared uh, courtyard. And basically it was a C-shape. This is the uh, south was, was this way, north-south is roughly this way. So this was facing southwest. And the clinic wanted their courtyard to be on the ground because they knew that they would be having some spiritual dances. And they wanted to be dancing on Mother Earth, not a garage. And so that had, the garage had to be on grade. It wraps around here on the first floor. And that's an on grade. And then the courtyard for the housing, which sits above, is sitting on top of the clinic. You can see the courtyard down here. We had a kiva in, in the middle of it. 
It's called Seven Directions, but Marty Wakazu, who was the chairman of the board of the health center, he started the health center some 40 years ago. Um, as he said, uh, there are seven important directions in life, the cardinal points, east, north, southwest, and the uh, heavens above and the earth below, and then the path to the inner self, seven directions. And so he wanted seven circles. Circles are very important symbol in nearly all North American tribes, probably because of the sun and the moon. And so this number seven was when you want to see seven circles. So we have seven in here, the Kiva, the medicine wheel at the lobby, the, the first uh, reception area to the clinic on the second floor, and then the waiting room for the medical, the waiting room for dental. And there's another one in a window that's indoors that looks out. Anyway, there were seven of them. And there's the courtyard above the, um, the clinic. So we enlisted some Native American artists. Uh, one did, helped us with uh, figuring out what to do. We always had this idea of putting this big marquee um, International Boulevard had lots of those kinds of signs of, of its history. And this was a, like a big eagle's feather um, with seven pairs of steel uh, uh, angles. And there was supposed to have been one inch thick uh, glass prisms in them beveled to allow the sun when they, this was on a north-south axis, you could see it here on edge, north-south. When the light would come in the afternoon passing through, it would cast these seven rainbows on the facade, but it, that was gonna cost another 13,000 at the very end. There was no money left to be able to buy the glass prism. So we just get the shadows. You can see them in there, the seven pairs of, uh, of steel shadows. We had some uh, tile work at the top, mimicking some of the, the patterns found in the baskets of the Ohlone. And the column at the entry to the clinic we had actually a Latino artist, a Latina uh, artist, a mosaic artist do that. And there are seven mythical stories uh, from seven different tribes portrayed in, in the mosaic. Here she is, um, Tamara Rivas is, is her name. And I discovered she was so articulate about her work. That's why she was hired by the Native American Health Center to do the job. And I found out a year later, we had lunch together um, that she was actually a judge for the federal government. And she was a ceramicist <laughs> by night. That was her love in life was her night job, um, being a ceramicist, a, mo a mosaic artist. Uh, there's the medicine mill in the lobby, the two-story lobby. At the half landing, we have a little perch here for speaker events that, we, that may happen in the two-story lobby. Um, you can see the courtyard uh, beyond. Up on the second level, we hired an artist from the Tlingit tribe in Alaska to create these two totems, which symbolize uh, the story of the birth of his tribe. Oh, the courtyard down at the, the clinic level is the Kiva with a, an important, uh, let's see, that was, this was the east entrance. It was the south entrance. And then the, at the um, north end, there was a kind of a little podium for any, Speakers that might be there, and that was a, a, a decomposed granite for the dance uh, surface. The back wall was a, a stone, a California stone, if I remember correctly, and it was planted and water drips down it. And now it's actually filled with stuff, with plants. And then the quiet courtyard up above, you can't even hear, hear the sounds of the city when you're when you're up there, and. Moving on down to Hispanino, this was a few years earlier, late 90s when this was finished. Also involved in the Native American community because Don Davenport was partly African-American and partly uh, Seminole. And as were a number of African-Americans in the neighborhood were part Native American as well. So this was a joint venture between the San Antonio CDC, Community Development Center. Um, I'll try not to it, into too much detail, but basically we had retail across the front, along with the childcare center and community center, parking for the residents as well as some retail parking. But all the three and four bedroom units had their own two-story houses to keep them out of the kids out of the elevators and the corridors. We had some flats, three bedroom flats in there, and two bedroom flats uh, to be accessible, but 
all the ones, um, childless households are up in the, the two front buildings. So the uh, smallest families were here and the biggest families had their own houses uh, in the back with an entrance uh, from International Boulevard, a ground floor courtyard with stairs up to the podium level and elevators from these two buildings also brought those who were disabled up to this level as well. For the first few years, we had this idea of having street vendors. We had five foot deep recesses with pull down doors so we could have street vendors. And it lasted only about two years. We were just too far off the beaten path from the Fruitvale area, which has a lot of foot traffic. It's just this kind of no man's land between this block and the Fruitvale zone. And, and so the, the, the these guys didn't last more than two years. Uh, and so now the ground floor here, and there, there were vendors in here as well, this vendors hall, but it, it eventually became uh, office space for nonprofits. And there, there was retail on the other side as well. Um, this yard is filled with play equipment now for the child care center. Uh, let's see what else I got here. We have the three story townhomes for the four bedroom units along this little muse at the, at the West End. And there are all the two-story townhomes on top of the podium for the families with, with children. And again, the singles, uh, couples, and uh, small households in the elevated portion of the building. We did hire four artists um, using a grant from the NEA and some money from the construction contingency. Mia Kodani did 14 of these panels up in the towers that faced onto um, International Boulevard, uh, celebrating the variety of people who live along. There were 72 languages along International Boulevard. So this is from the Native American community in the Southwest. This is from a Nigeria pattern in clothing and a clothing pattern uh, from the Hmong people of, of uh, Laos. Um, <clears throat> oh, I failed to mention, um, the front gate was done by a Latino artist who was just a few blocks down, a sculptor. He did the gate and the sign. And he asked the uh, Native American elders from the community to bless the facility when it was done and to name it. And when they saw the big gate that Ronaldo Terrazas had done of the um, big sunburst, they called it the gateway to the sun, which is what Hisman Hindu means in the local Ohlone uh, dialect. And Horace Washington, an African-American artist, did the various tiles across the front and the back of the arch. And then our, our muralist did this mural facing the BART tracks, which are only half a block away, to kind of, you know, tell the story about San Antonio and Ava. 99% of the people are good people trying to raise their kids as best they can on their minimum in incomes. And you only hear about the drug trade and, and drug murders but you don't know that 99% are really such, such good people. And I'm desperately trying now to remember the name of the muralist and it's, I'll probably end, remember it at the end of the talk. Uh, Daniel Galvez was the muralist. Moving on along, now number four, this was also in the late nineties. It was a first time homeowner project instigated by an organizer for OCO, Open Community Organizations who lived in this neighborhood it was primarily Latino, had its own church, a school, and uh, functioning industry, at least when we started the project in the early 90s. And after the workshops that we held in the basement of the church, they came up with this site plan of having these three sort of winners, uh, pedestrian auto courts, uh, and then backyard courts uh, here, and a child a space for a child care center uh, in, in this area. 54 families, 26 units, 70 bedrooms per acre, 105 people per acre. And the basic concept was to have a two-story house with a carport that could eventually become a garage with another room on top of it and an expandable attic. The attic started with a pony wall of about four or five feet. And with a, I think it was a 12-12 pitch we had, may have been an 8-12 pitch. Um, they could have an expandable attic. So one of the units had a bedroom on the ground floor off of the carport area uh, so that they could be a home business. 
with a um, kitchen dining in the back and then a living room on the second floor, bedroom and bath and another potential bedrooms and bath. We plumbed it so that the there could be bathrooms up there. And fortunately, uh, we, we didn't originally have the stair up to the attic, but they found money in the contingency to make it happen. So in, we got it in, in time, put it into the um, uh, framing and the stair was there available. And sure enough, within weeks after they were occupied, we could see lights on up in the attic. People were already beginning to use it, even though initially it was unfinished. So there's a party wall that runs down through here. This is one house. We demonstrated the ones that are along the street with the full garage and, and, and room on top. I think that was the living room in this case. It may have been a bedroom. Um, and then all the utilities, the, the meters, gas and electricity meters had to be put in these sort of closets because there wasn't enough frontage on the houses to really put them in there. And so they were brought here and then distributed under the, the central drives uh, to each of the, of the units. So that's the attic level, kitchen dining, uh, I'm sorry, kitchen dining, living generally here, bedrooms here, and the slot for the, um, for the car. Some of the houses had a bedroom down in the back for parent, uh, grandparents, right off the, an accessible bathroom. So they could have a third generation living in the house. And then in the front, we had the two-story elements to match the neighborhood, which is mostly two stories. And these three-story attic-like spaces are back in off the woodworks. And I always love to show these, but the landscape is so important. It plays a much more important role years later, 10 years later, this is what the street looks like. So you don't see the architecture anymore, but you see what people really care about. It's the green, the landscape. Only architects worry about what it's going to look like as a building. Uh, and then the last one was senior housing. And that one was finished about 09. Um, see, Curtis was involved in this one as well. Uh, and maybe Curtis and Teresa and others can help me remember who all the team, team members were at the time. But yeah, Betsy. Um, Betsy was, of course, yes, Betsy was prime on this. Um, and she lives not far from here, too, in the same neighborhood as I live in. Um, and she could talk more about this as well when, during the Q&A. But it's a long, thin, deep site. And the front portion had to be double loaded, uh, you know, to get the units in. But the back was open air walkway, single loaded. So we got the through ventilation for the back units, the various uh, senior facilities and the manager's office and that sort of thing are down here. And it was parking for 16 for 64 or 65 units, I can't quite remember. 65 units were in there. That's about 100 units to the acre, 100 bedrooms to the acre, and only about 110 per acre because they're mostly single women. Some married couples, the guys tend to die sooner. So these senior housing generally becomes um, uh, mostly women who, who live there. And that's the little courtyard that's on top of the garage and it had three little sub rooms off of it. With, with trellises above. We hired a, a glass artist to do this, um, the glazing up in the top. We kind of saw this as a big tiara, if you will, a crown uh, to reward the seniors for their lifelong contribution to our society and to this, to this town. Um, we had a trellis to mark the kind of double height arcade, even though this is housing as well, we just needed the feel of a grander arcade on such a major boulevard and topped it off with the trellis, covered it with vines. And we found re more recently that it had become home to a bunch of pigeons who left what pigeons leave. Minute, and three minutes. Oh, three minutes. Okay, well, I'm almost done. And they left a mess here. So Curtis and I have been involved with um, the client on this one, Saha, Satellite Affordable Housing to find a way to eliminate the pigeon roost, um, but still do something attractive. It's not easy. We had an outdoor deck behind glass. The back courtyard, uh, when we first moved in, we had the raised planters, and now the seniors have of course, filled those planters with vegetables, the trees have filled up. The walkways in the back, again, the green thumbs of all the seniors, put those to good use. 
we had put these flower boxes in there to encourage them. And they not only used the flower boxes, but they used to hold the walkways as well. Uh, I know a nun who used to work in West Oakland. We did work together out in West Oakland. She moved to a little town in, in um, um, Mississippi, Tutwiler, <clears throat> and immediately there working with the clinic, created a community center and got all the women in the town. There were only about 1,500 people in the town. Got the women together to create this um, uh, quilting bee. And we buy quilts from them with our senior housing. Put them, putting them in front of elevators, uh, different ones on each floor, you know, for orientation. So why bother design affordable housing for the bottom 40% if we are only doing it for 5%? That was my opening question. And are we a smoke screen? Well, my attitude is we do need to create models that show the world how good things could be for everyone if wealth and resources were more equitably distributed. So in a sense, we're poets. We're messengers of hope. That's what we can expect to be. We're not solving the problem, uh, not by a long shot, but we keep hope alive, if you will, in the face of another cartoon from the Gilded Age, just updated a bit with who the big monies are now who control Congress and make it impossible for that bottom 40% to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. And that's my, that's my thing. Thank you so much, Michael. <clears throat> I'll applaud out loud. Please unmute yourselves and uh, applause if you feel so. No, that's okay. <laughs> you didn't get the proper applause at the beginning. Okay. Um, so we're going to enter some questions and answer time. Should I so... now unshare my screen? Is that right? Sure. Get a big picture of you. you we can see everybody then, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so please put your questions in the chat. Um, I'll start it off. Um, thank you so much for, for doing this, uh, this talk. I think it was really provocative and, and really informative. I had a question that you've, you showed projects from various years, right? That you've, and you've been doing this for, uh, I'll say 30 years, 55 years, right? It's 55 years you've been well, doing housing. Well, the office has been around since 84, so that's 38 years. Okay. And it's All got right. six great principles, some of whom I see are in the audience. So they'll have plenty to say, I'm sure. <laughs> So what have you seen that that's changed? You know, you kind of your thesis kind of outlined what was going on now. Uh, have you seen yeah. a um, deterioration in in America of yeah. affordable housing? And or yeah. well, are there people? Uh, and then I guess uh, in addition to that, is there other countries that are showing uh, yeah, promise well, of how they approach things? Yeah, Euro European countries have always had made social housing uh, an important top priority and their housing stock is much better than ours. Their affordable housing is just an envy of the world. Um, that's why I go there often just to see what, what they're doing. Um, and we, we, we're just spitting in the wind. Um, the subsidies might be greater than they have been years ago, but the, they stretched further years ago, especially in a region like this where construction costs have gotten so high they need so many layers of, of financing. It takes them so many years to just get their finance, the capital stack, as they say, together to make the project move forward. It's, it's not atypical for a project to take seven years from the time it walks into our office to the time there are people walking into the building, maybe even longer. Whereas I remember back in the early 90s, three years, nonprofit shows up with the project, the site, we do a community process, design it, get it approved, get it built. People are walking in the door three years after it first came into our office. Now it's seven, 10 years. Um, so things have gotten worse. And it's the sad part of it is we, we did this book, Willie uh, Pettis, uh, Tom Jones and I back in 96, which is now 26 years ago. And we scoured the nation for good examples of affordable housing. And there were large portions of the country where practically nothing is being done whatsoever. It's really the bigger cities, the wealthier cities that can chip some money into the pot, um, you, you know, to help subsidize the, the housing to make it happen. But for the bulk of the country, it, it, it's not happening. This big middle section of the country that votes Republican, that's you know, been duped by QAnon and Trumps and all those kinds of people, uh, they're really hurting. 
and then they get taken advantage of. They don't know why the world is so screwed up for them. They didn't screw up, the world screwed them. And, uh, and they're feeling the pinch and there's no one out there really producing much affordable housing on their behalf. So yeah, things have gotten worse. I hate to say it's it. worse. Mm -hmm. There's some promising words for all the young architects out there. I know, and this is a bit depressing for the younger architects, but um, you know, take it with a grain of salt. I'm a 78 year old fart and I see things a little differently now. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Uh, Winston Wynn had a question, which I also thought was really interesting, this idea of reframing units per acre to bedrooms or people per acre. And he was asking, is how we talk about housing in the U US helpful or hurtful to the cause of making more of it? Have you found other benefits or surprises about talking about people per acre? Yeah, um, people per acre helps and this uh, people have a better sense of, of the density issue, but you know, it's a commodity in, in this country, even though in 1949, the housing rights law was passed or bill was passed Everybody has a right to housing. We don't live by that, whereas European countries do take it much more seriously. Um, and so it's not a right, it's a commodity bought and sold. So those who have more money in their pockets get more housing, more of it. And those who don't get less of it or none at all, it's, it's a commodity. And until that changes, and it doesn't look promising, we no longer have a, a Supreme Court. It, it too is politicized and it's gonna be for the next 30 years moving towards a more authoritarian society. And if things don't go well in 22 and 24, we may, we're right at that tipping point. We could fall into another authoritarian. We could become an authoritarian regime as well. Um, and that was stuck for many decades with little use of the government to help uh, solve this housing problem. You know, it's not a housing problem. It's a, it's an income problem. It's the wealth distribution and income distribution problem. We do all this work. I say we, everybody in the country, working hard, intellectual labor, manual labor, and we get a pittance for the value that we create. The bulk of it is going elsewhere. Um, you know, we get paid once for, for the housing and then we watch it turn over again and again and again. Realtors are getting 6% every time it turns over. So um, it ain't fair, it just ain't fair. Uh, Michael, I have a question. Sure, Ed. <laughs> How are you? I'm fine, how are you doing? I'm good, thanks. Been a I while. <laughs> now, Projects take 10 years and then a project gets uh, started. Let's say, let, let's say Foodville. Now gentrification happens. Those low cost housing, do they increase in value? What happens to those? Do they sort of stay? Yeah, they're permanently affordable they're because permanently of the nature. Yeah, the nature of the funding, uh, it comes with those uh, deed restrictions. They must remain affordable in perpetuity. Um, and so is that, does that have, uh, let's say, a, a price point every year? That it, it, there's a there's a rent increase. It's a modest. It's based on the um, uh, uh, consumer price index, but it's a modest raise. It's not following the raises that are happening out there in the market. Okay. I should qualify what I just said. A lot of the money comes with um, some of it comes with a hundred year um, life. Some of it comes with 55, and after 55, the, the nonprofit who owns it has to uh, re refinance it and find new subsidy sources. But for all intents and purposes, it's, it does not fall into the hands of the private market. Now, there are private developers who take advantage of the federal tax credit program, right. and they'll do it for maybe 15 or 20 years, and then they'll turn it over into the private market. And so they just wait for that moment when they can convert it from affordable to market rate. Now those are market rate developers who will do affordable housing do that. But the nonprofits seek to keep it affordable for as long as, as possible. So, so you have very nice projects in Fruitvale. So 
now have you seen let's say examples where all around you market rate housing is being sold in you know well, side by side you have one this rent control and the other one is yeah, kind of going up in price yeah um we have projects in downtown Oakland, affordable projects in downtown Oakland that are a block from market rate, across the street from market rate right. housing. And um, ours is very affordable, continues to be, and the other stuff around it just keeps escalating uh, upwards. So they can um, exist, is that, is that, I guess? What's that? Affordable housing and market rate can coexist. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. Well, that's hopeful, isn't it? Yeah, that is a good sign. Um, now, there are some private developers, we were working with one, that try to do both at the same right. time. And usually what happens, because of the nature of the funding sources and the huge gap in incomes, um, and the fact that the affordable must be owned by a nonprofit, it must remain affordable, and must sit on its own land, it must be its own building. So it sits next to the market rate right. as a separate building with separate entrances. Some people get offended by that, which is, I think, bullshit liberalism. They're existing on the same block, for Christ's sake. Yes. You know, you can't get any better than that. They're not on opposite sides of a railroad track. They're right next door to each other. They're neighbors. Right. That's good enough for me. And, um, and we actually had one going for a decade, and it just died on the vine because they couldn't get all of its funding together. We're in, there were 90 affordable units and 270 market rate units, and they shared the amenity spaces. Wow. Same swimming pool, same lounges, same courtyard. So they, that developer was willing to mesh them more on a social level, as did the nonprofit. Again, Ibalsi, East Bay Asian Local Development Corporation, and, and Michael uh, Johnson of Urban Corps. Um, but it was very hard to do them because they, they get their funding at, at different cycles, at different paces. Right. And they were never quite in the same place to get all their funds in at the same time. And they couldn't, they had renewed their development agreement with the city for three or four times. And, and then the newest city council, being good progressives that they are, wanted to see all the site to be affordable housing. So they voted down the, the extension to allow them to fill out their their capital stack. And so the project died after 10 years. Uh, and that to me was gonna be an interesting experiment of how people at 60, 50, uh, 30 to 50, 60% of AMI were gonna be coexisting with people at 250, 300% AMI. We'll let, we won't get to see it happen as an experiment. It's gonna be all affordable, which is okay, I guess. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> So there's a question from Anya Chen. Is there anything the city government can do better to encourage affordable housing? And Jennifer Liu also kind of talked about California overall. So can you talk about like the difference between local and California yeah. and maybe even federal and yeah. what we all can do yeah. and advocate for? Again, to put it into context, there are states in this country where there's no funding for affordable housing from state level or from a local city level, it just doesn't happen. Um, and so in California, states like California, Washington, Oregon, and on the East Coast, the Northeast, uh, there's more funding for affordable housing in those regions. They're more progressive, let's be frank about it. And so um, you'll get county measures passed by the citizens, bond measures for affordable housing. You'll get state level bond issues past that create funding for affordable housing. Um, it, they seem like big numbers, a couple of billion here, a couple of billion there. You know, after a while, it adds up to real money as the saying goes, but it's never really enough to meet the need. We need hundreds of thousands of affordable units and uh, it's not being produced at, at the rate needed. So as much as this is a rich state and does better than other states and putting money towards affordable housing, it's not, it's, it's not enough. And so these projects usually have city money, county money, state money, federal money, some private foundations 
might be putting in some money. So it's a whole, they have to um, cobble together money from many sources. That's why it takes so long. You know, the construction is the fastest part of it. <laughs> Designing, getting your entitlements and going through the community process sometimes takes longer than uh, the construction. But then after you get the entitlements, the task of getting all the funding in place takes multiple years. So Jennifer Lou also had a question about affordable, more affordable ways to build housing. Is there any uh, magic wands out there? Um, she's mentioning prefab robotics. Um, do you have any uh, secrets Bull for us? To... It's all bullshit. <laughs> I'll be frank. I can, at my age, I can, I can use this language. <laughs> um, there's a lot of hype about what modular construction can do. And when you talk to people who are really serious about it in the industry and are honest about it, at least for the wood modular, uh, the ones that we've worked with said, you know, six, six percent, seven percent savings over the conventional if everything goes smoothly. You know, there are others out there claiming 20 percent savings. It's nonsense. And a number of them have gone bankrupt. Katera was one that had you know, all this vertical integration and robots and all kinds of crap. You know, the whole line, uh, they went bankrupt. Uh, so there were a lot of, of um, smoke and mirrors out there about the silver bullet that will make housing more affordable. Um, you gotta make good housing and good housing is not cheap. You want it to last. It's not just something that's gonna be around for five years and then blow away. It's, it's gotta be serious, well-built stuff because unlike market rate housing, at least in, in the urban areas, denser urban areas where they have no kids, not in the high rises. It's just adults. They're not abusing the property. Kids are kids. Their job is to deconstruct the world, right? <laughs> Until they reach a certain age where they know they're not supposed to do that. So the, the affordable housing for families takes more of a beating. Um, and so you got to really do your best to make them really uh, hardy, sturdy, uh, resilient, um, and that's not cheap. So I, I don't think there's any silver bullet out there that's gonna save the world. And let's face it, the modular stuff, the robotic stuff, all that is doing is reducing the labor input, right? And that's the opposite of what should be happening. We need more people with good jobs so they can afford their own housing. And we're actually reducing the number of people in the construction sector. It doesn't make sense. At least Ford realized He's got to pay his workers a decent wage so they could buy his cars. <laughs> yes, that's great. Um, I thought it was really interesting that you, how, how you, the projects you showed as your examples, you talked a lot about the art in them and the artists and just, um, you want to talk a little bit more about why, at least for this presentation, you thought that was important and then. Yeah. Well, the office is just getting better and better at integrating more and more artists. It's just great to watch on more recent projects and the beautiful signatures that are being left on the building of the ethnic groups that live within and around the housing. Um, but we started it years ago with this effort to recognize that, you know, the folks who live here um, need to have a way of expressing their presence. Granted, 50 years from now, it'll be different people but at least they'll know who was there before them and who made this happen. Um, there are co-ops in the Bronx that were introduced in the 20s that are still there. A whole other group of people are living there now, but they were uh, socialist and communist Jews who created the co-ops in the Bronx. Um, and there's even a, a lintel, some of the lintels have the you know, hammer and sickle um, embedded in the, um, in the lintel. It was a different era. And, uh, you know, they hadn't yet fully understood and known what Stalin was doing. So there's tremendous disenchantment occurred uh, in that community uh, once they saw what really happened in the Soviet Union. Um, but the hopes for what socialism could bring um, is still there, it's still there alive and well amongst some of us. And, um, and maybe it will have, a, have an opportunity. We need more AOCs and squads in the, in the Congress. 
Um, is someone had asked me a question about community outreach in your process in this country and in your process overall for these projects? Is the art part of that community outreach? Um, is that help bring well, that so, community? You know, some of it's yeah, some of it's the nonprofit client themselves. They say, you know, we're going to have to really they really want to engage the community. I mean, most planning commissions and planning authorities and planners require some community engagement, even for the market rate stuff. And for market rate, it's a pro forma thing. You design it for the for the developer and then you bring it to the public and you take shots and maybe you tweak it a little bit. It's not real engagement from the start in shaping the project. And we've been fortunate a number of times to be able to do that. So we get real community input that helped create what the outcome finally was. Um, and there's the nonprofit that will do, will sometimes ask the nonprofit, can we really make this a little bit more, have, have a little bit more community engagement? Because the, the nonprofits now that we work for have been around now for 40 plus years. So they're very established, savvy developers. And after a while, the development arm of those nonprofits behave like private developers. You know, They want it to go as quickly and smoothly as possible, spend as little time as possible on the community process, just get this thing in the hopper they can start you know, raising monies. Um, so uh, they're not the same nonprofits that they were 30 years ago, who came out of you know, social purpose roots. And of course, community engagement was the starting point. It was the scenic one on of affordable housing. It's less so now because it's a business. And a number of the executive directors of some of these big nonprofits went to business school. You know? So they come with that bottom line attitude. Um, that's not true of a lot of the staff, but you know the culture starts at the top. And um, I'm, I'm afraid some of the bigger nonprofits tend to be more too, too concerned about the business aspect, less about the community aspect. I'm, that's sort of true. Not as bad as I might have portrayed it just then with those words. But it's drifted in that direction. I just wanted to interject and say that there's some uh, folks from your office, Mike. Um, do you want to invite anyone uh, to say a few words uh, to support some of the work or the words that you have expressed or shared with us? Well, there's, I see Curtis, I see Teresa, I saw Peter there somewhere in the pile. Yeah, he had to sign off. He had to sign off. Um, Parissa is there. Who else? Um, well, we're actually going to uh, wanted to share with everyone before they leave that that we have the Casa Arabella tour coming up on June 16th, um, and it's going to be from four to five, and it's a block away from Fruitdale Bart Station, right? So we want, you know, for all of you who are here, want to really get to know Mike Pytok's office work more um, personally, this would be a great opportunity to really come and see it. And it's going to be led by Mike Pytok and Kurt Skaten. Um, do you want to talk about that uh, tour or maybe Curtis wants to talk about it a little bit? We give Curtis a chance to talk. Oh, uh, well, I think, you know, it's a good example of, uh, infill housing for families. Uh, and it's pretty great to see them, uh, the kids in action. And as Mike described, the a little bit of the engineering uh, of, uh, of lifestyle uh, and, and making it suit the different unit types um, in a tight, tough location. Um, it's also a great example of wonderful management, facility management by a Balti um, and the art. So it's, yeah, it's a good one. It wraps it all together. And of course there's a phase two under construction. So you get a, we'll get up in the building and you'll get an eyeball down into, into the neighboring construction as well. Um, anyway, I, I would also just say that it's, it's been a great privilege to work with Mike and to, to do this work. Uh, like he says, it's, it's serving uh, a small percentage of, of the need, but um, it, it's hard work uh, in design and architecture, no matter what uh, uh, the building type, um, that these types are so rewarding. I, I, I know that those days 
that we've all shared, all the folks that work in the firm, the opening days of the project are, are incredibly satisfying. And, um, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity to have done that. Teresa, I see you in there hiding behind that picture. Hello, yeah, I'm I'm still here. <laughs> yeah, thank you for the talk. That was always great. Yeah. Anything you want to add, Teresa? Um it was great to see um to see the project spike. I love walking down this road and I love feeling proud about my contribution too. Um, when I see some of them. Um, oh, you worked on the orchards, the, the senior housing with Betsy. I did. Yeah. I did. Yeah. Um, and, uh, it was a great experience and it was a great opportunity to work, um, with you and using a pencil at times, um, which doesn't always get to happen anymore. Um, and I don't, you know, for for some of uh, some of the other folks out here, I mean, I specifically went into affordable housing because of a a, a speech that Mike uh, gave or a presentation at my college. Um, so that aspect, I don't know um, that you really highlighted on that, Mike. How how many um, careers you've influenced uh, that way, also. So thank you. That's true. I'm sorry I messed up your life, Teresa. <laughs> Brian, any other questions that we have time to cover? I think that was a pretty good wrap up. I was kind of, I, I love that. So I'm happy once you close this out. Okay. Well, I'm so uh, proud to, to be part of this community. And uh, definitely, Mike, you've influenced the lives of many architects, including mine. Um, remember you were a mentor uh, of the students that were doing the Bank of America Housing Challenge. <laughs> yes. And that, that is, well. I met you. <laughs> uh, that's, so that's where I, we met. Oh, okay. Support Theresa on that statement. But uh, I think um, what I wanted to say is that what inspires me to do architecture is really at the core of what you're sharing today and it's really making a difference. And uh, even if it's only 5%, um, it's really worth doing. So thank you for all your work, your life's work. Um, and just, uh, we just wanted to encourage everybody to come and watch and, and walk and experience one of his projects and the, his firm's project. Uh, it takes a village to build these and design them. So, um, and uh, we really look forward to continuing the conversation at the AIA. Um, we are going to continue to do uh, high quality um, housing conversations down the line. So please uh, stay tuned for a fall uh, forum on housing. And uh, thank you so much for attending. This is really rewarding and it really was wonderful to get and see, uh, hear people's questions and the engagement and the interest uh, that all of you showed. So uh, thank you very much. Brian, anything else? Lasting words? You did great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. I really appreciate yes, and thank you and... again for inviting me. And thank you, everybody, for giving up valuable time to <laughs> waste it this way. But, um, one parting word is as much as what I may have said is depressing, you got to keep a sense of humor at all times in this field. No matter what you're working on, uh, you just have to be able to laugh at yourself. Um, because things get pretty intense and you get angry about a lot of things. Um, so there were times you just have to pinch yourself, say, don't take this so seriously and then find a way to crack a joke about it all. This way you sleep at night. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's wisdom for life. Thank you. All right, Thank folks. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks to the AIA for organizing this yes, and, and the great. group, Madeline and great. Brian. Pleasure. Thank Good you. Job. Thank Thanks you. Bye, folks. <laughs>